Thanks for the invite to speak, and, and I wanted to I wanted to start with. Um, God, it's slightly painful to think back over it, really, but it is about four years now, nearly four years. So we've had this government, this coalition government, which of course no one voted for. You know, no one went into a ballot box and put a cross and a bit of paper saying, "Can I have a kind of a holy alliance?" Of the, of the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives, please. Um, so no one voted for it. Nonetheless, it's been there for four years. And it's been single-mindedly committed to one thing. They bickered about everything else. They've been single-mindedly committed to one thing, which is imposing austerity. It doesn't matter whatever else happens, they are sticking to their guns on this. Absolutely determinedly. As soon as the coalition was announced and formed, they made it clear in their agreement that what they wanted to do was impose what amounts to the, the biggest program of spending cuts in this country essentially since the 1930s. So two, three, four generations that you're looking back now. That's the scale of what they were initially talking about. And they told us that they, they wanted to do this um, because the last government messed up, because the last government spent too much money. You know, the cupboard is bare was George Osborne's quip. Uh, the credit card, the national credit card is maxed out, you know, we've got too many debts, uh, we've spent too much money, the money's not there, and it's like anybody else, that if you spent too much money, you know, you have to, and you borrow too much, then you have to rein back a bit, you know, this sort of makes sense, and this is a story that they pushed for the last four years or so, as an excuse, as their reason for pushing through the cuts. Now I just want to start with this, though I think it's worth underlining the point, is that this is complete nonsense from start to finish. The entirety of that story is based on a lie. Not one part of it stands up to a moment's scrutiny. If you just take the figures, and I'm being an economist, I do occasionally do some figures. If you just take the figures, the last Labour government, as a share of GDP, as a share of what the whole country produces, spent on average, up until the crash of 2008, 39% of GDP on public spending. The Tory government before, its Majors government, spent 40% of GDP on public spending, on average, year in, year out. Thatcher's government, 1979, all the way through to when she was thrown out of office in 1990, spent 40% of GDP on public spending. So in other words, the last Labour government spent less than the Tory government of John Major and the Tory government even of Margaret Thatcher, as a share of the whole economy. So this idea that they were hugely spendthrift, they were just going mad, you know, building hospitals all over the place, employing nurses and teachers and God knows what else. This idea that they were spendthrift, if they were spending too much, Major must have been as well, and Thatcher, because they spent more. So this idea that this government was uniquely bad, uniquely spending too much, just doesn't stand up uh, to the slightest bit of scrutiny. But that was the excuse we got for that was the excuse. We had to impose austerity because of the debt, the national debt, the government's debt is too big. The problem with that, of course, is if, we, again, you look at the figures on this, you're looking at a government that's driven austerity, that's pushed hard at the cuts that we've heard about, that are obvious, that you can see happening, that's pushed hard at austerity, but what's happened to its borrowing? It's managed to borrow more in the last three years, £430 billion, pounds, than the previous government borrowed in 13 years, £429 billion. Pounds. But by pushing hard at austerity, by saying they want to do the cuts, by saying they're trying to get rid of the debt, the outcome of all of this is you end up borrowing more in three years than the previous government managed in 13. And there's a simple reason for that. It's a reason really that's been known since the 1930s, and it boils down to a, a story that the, the, the great liberal economist John Maynard Keynes once talked about, which is that Look, if I, if I go out to the shops and I spend some money, that's me spending money. If I go to the newsagents, buy a Mars bar, or whatever, you know, it's not product placement, but if I go and buy something from the shops, I spend 60p on a bag of crisps. I spend the money, the shopkeeper earns money. So if I don't spend the money, the shopkeeper doesn't earn money. So if I cut my spending, someone else earns less. If the government cuts its spending, a whole load of people earn less. And if a whole load of people are earning less, they pay less in taxes. And if the government's getting, getting less in taxes, it has to go out and borrow more. And that's the ridiculous mechanism we've been trapped into for the last three years. That's why borrowing has gone up and up. For all the cuts that are happening, because it damages the economy. It's not just that it's socially damaging. It means the bedroom tax. It means for people going to food banks. It also hits everything else that's going on. You get less in taxes, you have to borrow more. That's the kind of situation, that's the lunacy of austerity over uh, the last three, four years or so. So then you have to wonder, well, what's, what's kind of really, what's really going on at this point? And, and kind of, I think Cameron gave the game away. 
Because for honestly, I don't think they're stupid. I mean, they're unpleasant, but I don't think they're actively stupid. You know, the story I've told you is not like some mad fantasy thing. Go to the university down the road, dig out any economics textbook uh, that you like, it'll tell you something similar. This is known about. You have to wonder what on earth they're doing by imposing this. It's socially damaging, it hurts the whole economy, why are they doing it? And of course Cameron, I think, gives the game away when he starts to talk about uh, probably sensing how, if you say, you know, we have to make cuts because the economy's weak and the economy starts growing, quite reasonably people turn around and say, well, why are you still it's making cool. cuts yeah. if the economy's growing? He cups up at the Lord Mayor's banquet, no less, uh, speaking from a, a golden throne, which is obviously an ideal, it's a lectern, a golden lectern, obviously an ideal place to make announcements like this, uh, and says, well, austerity has to be permanent. To this baying mob of, of city financiers who lapse this sort of thing up, that austerity has to be permanent. But it was never about the lie, the myth of having to repay the debt. It was always about something rather different. It was about something permanent. Now, we didn't vote for the coalition. We certainly didn't vote, and none of us were told that the austerity program was going to be permanent. It was sold to us as a temporary measure, sort everything out, pay off some debt, get back on track. Permanent austerity is what Cameron's talking about. And I think what lies behind it is two things. One is, I think the commitment here is, you have to say, it's ideological. Yeah. That when push comes to shove, they're doing this because they like doing this, they want to do this, they hate public services, they hate the people who use public services, and that even if there was no other external reason to do it, they'd still be wanting to do this. We know this much. You know, some people sometimes think the, the Lib Dems are, are fluffy in this one, you know, they're nicer people or something. Nick Clegg, Vince Cable and David Laws all signed up, all wrote pieces for a little manifesto back in the early 2000s, the Orange Book, in which they argue for the privatisation of the post office and breaking up the NHS. Yeah. With Norman Tennant, who was one of the more unpleasant members of Margaret Thatcher's cabinets back in the 80s. I mean, more unpleasant in Margaret Thatcher's cabinets is... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a fascinating interview in which she said all sorts of mad things. The one thing in particular stuck out, the interviewer asked him, uh, so, so, Mr. Teddy, do, do you have any regrets about what Thatcher was? Was there stuff, was there anything that, that you could have done better, could have done differently? And he basically says, but yeah, we didn't push hard enough on welfare and on education. And what are the two things that this government has zeroed in on? You know, whether... Uh, regardless of what teachers or parents might say about education, or students for that matter, they push and push and push at education. And the offensive on welfare, and offensive is about the right word, which isn't just IDS, you know, parading around the place. It's also this nonsense of benefits streets and the attacks and scrounges and all the rest of it. It's yeah. real push at completing the business of Margaret Thatcher. And that is the ideological uh, part of what's going on here. That's one bit of it. But I think there's also something else, and this gets into something that, that Ross touched on, which is, in the end, this is, this is about power. This is about the kind of economy we live in. You know, austerity doesn't benefit, I would guess, anybody in this room. Uh, I doubt that very, very much. You probably wouldn't be here, to be honest. You know. So austerity doesn't benefit anybody in this room. It doesn't benefit anyone most of us know, I'd imagine. It doesn't benefit probably 99% of the people who live around here, or across great swathes of the country. Austerity benefits one group of people, and one group of people only, and that's the rich. And it's a particular part of the rich who it benefits in particular. That's the rich who hold debt. That's the rich who are involved in finance. Because yeah. what does austerity mean? Austerity means I don't care if you're being chucked out of your house because of bedroom tax. I don't care if you have to go to a food bank. I don't even care about the state of the entire economy. In the end, drive it right back into recession, because we do this. What I care about is saying that if you hold debt, that debt will be repaid. And you privilege that above everything else you can think of. So austerity is about a very, very particular kind of economy that we now live in, in which finance is above any other consideration that we have. And we have a government that thinks precisely like that, often in the crudest way possible. 52% of Tory donations over the last year came from basically city interests, financial, uh, directly financial services interests, people in hedge funds, very, very rich bankers, that sort of thing. This is a government for bankers. This is a banker's government. And it behaves in a way that they like, irrespective of what everyone else does. So what to do about it, and this is the alternatives part and what we might do. Look, I think it's touched on, I think you see it on, on the, the, the platform here. Um, the critical bit, I think, and by the way, I think this is winnable, you know. I think you've seen over just this year how what looks like sometimes a very determined <coughs> government, they want to give that impression, can start to run into 
not even unexpected. I mean, it's unexpected if you don't believe in climate change, like our, our environment minister chooses not to. But if you run into something like floods, and lo and behold, there are serious floods everywhere, and lo and behold, you've cut flood defence spending by 25% over the last three years. You know, this is not a completely unexpected result. And suddenly they're flapping. And suddenly, of course, Cameron, when he sees the waters inching towards, you know, Henley and Thames and other such places, declares that money is no object. Well, so much for austerity. How about that for running a coach and horses through the entire Indeed. argument that they've been presented for the last three, four, five years now? Money is no object. Well, if money's no object to deal with floods in the leafy bits of Oxfordshire, it's no object to deal with uh, people facing eviction from the bedroom tax. It's no object to deal with any number of the other things. Of course, money isn't really no object. There's an immense amount of wealth out there. Large British businesses are sitting on £750 billion pounds in their bank accounts that they're just not spending. They're not spending means people don't get jobs. That's the, the situation of it. Their money is absolutely out there. It's just in the wrong hands, being used for the wrong purposes at this point in time. We are divided. If we do swallow some of the nonsense, not just about people who are on benefits and all the rest of it, but also the, these floods, uh, other kind of floods, of Romanians and Bulgarians are all supposed to be turning up and taking everyone's jobs and taking all the benefits and clogging up the NHS. And all. By the way, I've not actually seen any sign of this. And if you, you, know, you see the survey of, of the, the plane um, operators and the coach drivers and the rest of it just in the, in the papers last weekend, Big survey of them. Has there been a big increase in demand from Romania and Bulgaria? Well, lo and behold, no, there hasn't. There's been less people from Romania and Bulgaria coming so far this year. So, so much for the nonsense around that. But the point here is to say, well, actually, it isn't about the bankers. It isn't about the people at the top. It's about the people next door to you. It's about someone over here. It's scapegoated. So, the first one is unity. And that means a unity like you get in this room, a unity of saying we can't have any cuts anywhere. It's not a case of saying don't cut the fire services, but let's have the bedroom tax. So that's saying we don't need any of these cuts. We should stop all of them. We should oppose all of them. So it's absolutely critical that you get the unity out of it. I think it's also critical, and I, and I think, you know, I, well, I'm not going to speak for everyone in the room. I mean, look, I'll be very glad in 2015 if this government is voted out of office. But I think it's also critical that that doesn't mean we disband and think everything's going to be all right. You know, I think the situation we've got at the minute is in lots of different ways, economically in lots of different ways, and with the best will in the world, I think you have a Labour leadership who needs that kind of pressure applied to them, the kind of pressure that we can apply to them to make sure they don't suddenly start backsliding into saying, well, maybe a bit of austerity, maybe even a lot of austerity. Maybe we're going to be trying to do austerity nicely, because you can't. There isn't a way to do any of this stuff nicely. So it means after 2015, we also have to keep our eye on the ball and say we are not going to allow any cuts to any public services of any kind. That isn't what this movement is about. And the third one, I think, and, and I think we've got space to discuss this, is starting to think, look, it's all very well saying what you're against, what we're in favour of. What do you want to see positive happening? And I think probably between us, we can all start to think of different, better ways to run society than this. That there is no reason at all, if you want to deal with a housing crisis, I live in London, it's particularly acute there, there is no reason at all why the government can't borrow money and start building council houses. You solve the, uh, the housing crisis and you create jobs. Why can't that be done? You could do it tomorrow if you were minded to. You can no reason at all why you simply allow the rich, the really rich, not just the 1% but the 0.1% to treat tax how they're backing off a bit, I think, on the bedroom tax and other issues. You can start to see a sense that maybe we can get them on the back foot over this. But that means unity amongst ourselves. That means determination uh, when facing the other side. Thanks.